In many ways, I think I was the least likely candidate to become an Orthodox feminist activist. And in a certain sense, I've been on this incredible spiritual and intellectual journey without really ever leaving home. I was born into an Orthodox Jewish family in Seattle, Washington, and my earliest experiences of the spirit were grounded in the rich culture of an Orthodox way of life, of Sabbath observance and kosher food laws and holidays and study of Torah, <coughs> excuse me, my parents' involvement in communal institutions. And I think these factors of birth and geography were to affect the way that I was going to integrate feminism uh, in my 20s and 30s, in three ways in particular. One, it was communicated to me, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that being an Orthodox Jew was a great gift. It wasn't a burden, it was a joy. For example, on Friday afternoons, my father at about three o'clock in the afternoon would call out, girls, Girls, <laughs> who wants a mitzvah? A mitzvah is a good deed and a command, fulfillment of a commandment. And we immediately knew that he wanted us to polish his shoes, as kids used to do in those days. <clears throat> that was, and of course we all jumped, because who wouldn't want a mitzvah? And that, I always say that was the Tom Sawyer version of Orthodox Judaism. <laughs> So when the earliest feminists um, crit criticized the rabbis and patriarchy and tradition, I felt a certain cognitive dissonance because the rabbis were my heroes and not the enemy, and I wanted to defend them even as I was beginning to critique bits and pieces of the tradition myself. Secondly, family was central to my life, and it still is. It was the defining structure and still the most important aspect of my life. And as early radical feminism criticized the family as locus of the abuse, locus of abuse for women, I would have none of that. And third, Seattle, in Seattle, Orthodox Jews were a minority within a minority, and somehow I gained some early sense of what it took to bring me into the middle of the 20th century as an Orthodox Jew. And even though as, I, as an adult I understood that it's easier to destroy systems and quicker to destroy systems and hard to build them up, this was, although never articulated, never spoken, uh, just a part of my uh, psyche uh, from a very early age. And so I was always cautious about destroying what I knew had taken centuries to build up. Two more things about my upbringing. My father was very uncritical. He didn't like, I mean, he was not uncritical. He didn't like, he brooked no, no criticism about his beloved faith. Um, my father was a, a Talmud scholar, and he just communicated this great love of, of Judaism. Uh, my mother was, uh, loved criticism, um, not of the tradition necessarily, but just it was part of her total honesty. She certainly is the most honest person I've ever met, sometimes a little too honest for my comfort, but my mother could puncture every balloon and tell, see through every, every false note. So I grew up with that combination in terms of feminism, which was my mother would take no prisoners and my father would brook no criticism, <laughs> and uh, interesting combination. So I grew up very content, and um, I had no criticism of, and I didn't. I came to feminism without a sense of oppression at all. Um, I fulfilled all the normal expectations for an Orthodox Jewish girl and then Jewish woman, which was education and marriage and children. I actually had very few pre-feminist experiences. Um, only two that I can recall in all my early years. One was that I was a tomboy and I was pitcher of the ad hoc boys softball team. I don't know why I call that a feminist experience, but it, it was in some way. The other was when I was 19, I participated, I studied in Israel for seven months, 
And there were two things particularly that stood out vis-a-vis -vis women's roles. Um, this was a, a, a mixed gender group. But I had a teacher named Nechama Leibowitz, who was very famous now in those days. She was, she was famous in those days too, I guess, but not quite as. Uh, but she was g brilliant in sources and texts and rabbinic literature, and this was some, something totally new to me because these were areas of study that were closed to women. And so she was an extraordinary model. The second experience was with my roommate on a shopping trip. She took me to Mea Sha'arim, the religious section of Jerusalem, ultra-Orthodox, to a bookstore. And there she bought herself whole sets, several of them, of sacred books. Now, I never knew that a female could do this. I thought only men had libraries of religious texts. So I did the same thing, and I just simply bought whatever she bought. And even today, as I open up one of those books with my name in it, from the, that year, um, I feel a certain sense of thrill. And the truth is that I, I look now sometimes at the gifts that bat mitzvah girls get. It's still a lingering phenomenon. Bat mitzvah girls get mostly jewelry, and bar mitzvah boys get mostly books. Although I should add, the girls love the jewelry, and the boys don't always like the books, but so I forget <laughs> that. At any rate, I turned, returned to the United States and, and, and fell in love with a man, a rabbi, and uh, married in 1957, and in the early 60s began a family. And my first encounter with feminism, like millions of others, was reading The Feminine Mystique, and as it changed my life, albeit slowly. Um, and as I said, I didn't come to feminism out of a sense of oppression, but rather the, the idea of was very just. And the anger frightened me, but nevertheless, one could not let go of that idea. I, um, however, did not see that any of these ideas had anything to do with my being a Jewish woman. In that score, this was feminism, and this was Orthodox Judaism, and never the twain shall meet. Besides which, in my Orthodox Jewish life, I had, was, I had it all, which was a family that was validated in my community. I even had a part-time career and was going to graduate school. And I must say that part of the ability to do what I considered then having it all was that I relied on the help of other women in my home, in my household, and to them I'm eternally grateful to the housekeepers, babysitters, and nannies uh, that made it possible for me to do anything in my life um, in terms of accomplishing something uh, beyond family. Um, on the other hand, I wasn't totally brain dead in this area. Um, and there were, like everyone else, there were a series of cliques. Um, I'll just mention two. One, I realized that when I had studied with Nechama Leibowitz, the teacher in Israel, at the end of that period of time, I wanted to stay and have her just follow her around. For room and board, I would be her assistant and study from her day and night. And I was told by family and friends that this was a wild and crazy idea for a young woman and come home, which of course I did. The second one was, um, and I remember that my cousin of the same age, um, was told, wanted to do the same thing, and was given all the encouragement and stayed on for an extra year of study with his beloved teacher. The second was an experience that I had in my second year of, third year of, second year of marriage, uh, was an intellectual evening that we were invited to. I don't, for want of a better word, I called it a salon, salon kind of uh, discussion group. And after the lecture, there was time for questions, and I made a comment. I raised a question. I made a comment. And the speaker um, dismissed my comment. He repeated basically what he had said in the lecture as an answer, as if I hadn't heard what he said or, and I hadn't understood. Ten minutes later, a young rabbi in the audience asked the same question. And they fell all over him with this brilliant question. And I felt the sting. I actually felt the sting of this for many years. Um, there were not all that many 
incidents in that period of time, but there were enough to call that period of my life a period alternately. I called it a retroactive feminist righteous indignation, uh, or I'm not a feminist, but period. Um, uh, however, in 1973, a watershed experience occurred, and that was the first National Jewish Women's Conference. Um, it was, I was invited by a fluke, I, sh I must say, to give the, um, that's a story for another time, to give the keynote address. And um, if, I would, if I was a more religious person, I would have to say that God, God called me at that moment to be an Orthodox feminist, because I came to it all at once. I learned many things in preparation and the experience of the conference that were to stay with me for many years. One, that a dialectic existed in the tradition, both in the, within the tradition and vis-a-vis -vis Orthodox Judaism and feminism. That the tradition was a benevolent, there was a good deal of benevolence, and I know women were not into benevolence, but nevertheless it should be recognized that that's one way of interpreting the tradition. But, uh, and there, were all, there was also hierarchy, and that contrary to what I had been fed and taught, that Jewish women were on a pedestal, uh, there was a lot of disadvantage, disability, and one had to call a spade a spade. Secondly, that as I looked through the sources in preparation, systematically and altogether, I understood that a lot had changed. Again, this was contrary to the immutability of the tradition. And from that, I was able to articulate the principle, which uh, stood ha I stood by all these years despite immense criticism, uh, where there's a rabbinic will, there's a halachic way, which is to say that there's a great deal of subjectivity in the interpretation of the sources. Um, the dialectic between Orthodox Judaism and feminism was an interesting challenge because my talk was to critique Judaism from the perspective of feminism and to critique feminism from the perspective of Judaism. And I must say it was my, one of my experiences of getting a half of a standing ovation. I remember it clearly. <laughs> <laughs> because the feminists in the audience, many of them loved when I critiqued Orthodox Judaism but did, could not take a critique of feminism, which was a new orthodoxy for some. The other thing I learned was that you could, in fact, um, criticize from the conference itself. I learned, first of all, the value of cohorts and that there were things that were going on and had been going on and I wasn't aware of. Um, and I, I learned a, a sense of gratitude from that because there were many women who were far more qualified and uh, had far more, greater credentials than I uh, to give that keynote address. And they stepped aside to let an, a newcomer, so to speak, a neophyte, uh, come onto the scene. And um, I was very grateful, and I've, I've tried to uh, replay that and uh, learn that lesson in my own life, but I'll come back to that in a moment. I learned about the power of women for the first time. It was truly my first encounter with the power of women. It was a handful of young women who had put this conference together. I also learned that there was a group called Ezrat Nashim in the conservative movement that had been steadily working to reform the conservative movement. I learned that feminism was a way into religious tradition and not a way out for many women. I learned that you could criticize your own faith tradition and the earth didn't swallow you up that you could engage a critical eye and a loving heart at one of the same moment. I learned that if anyone tried to push you out, you just didn't have to go. <laughs> um, I learned that there's a difference between doing something and observing someone else do it. And that's very significant in Orthodox Judaism, which is focused on great on, on ritual. I learned how much I had to learn from non-Orthodox feminists. And um, I've been able to acknowledge that debt over the course of many years, because it's been an ongoing learning process for me. 
Um, the, uh, I didn't become a conservative or reform or reconstructionist woman, but a great deal of my own ideas about feminism were mediated through their understanding and their work. I'm keeping my eye on my clock and moving right along here. Um, I wanted to just focus on two points. Um, I, don't, I could talk about all the, what I've done in the last uh, in the last 20 years since that conference, the last 30 years. I'm sorry, the last 30 years. Uh, but I've decided instead um, just to say give one sentence about that and focus rather on what I call my 12-step program, to, is which is how I managed to stay in this movement uh, without getting burned out. So over the years, basically, I've continued with uh, lecturing and writing and doing, continuing to explore the dialectic in the tradition um, and creating an organization, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think I've been, I'm sometimes amazed at how I'm, I haven't thrown the towel in and how I still feel, can feel, although some swings down, but how I can still feel energized by this and, um, and uh, committed to it. So here are my 12 steps. I actually have far more than 12 steps, and my 12 steps change over time, but I'll give you some of them. Um, one is that I, I was called celebrate the gains. There have been incredible gains in orthodoxy, contrary to the widely held view that nothing ever changes within orthodoxy. I would say the cup is probably now more half full than half empty. And one, of, one example is this is the most learned generation of Jewish women in all of Jewish history. That's what happened, has happened in the last 30 years in the education of Jewish women. We have Talmud scholars and teachers where we had none 30 years ago, and this is really a great source of excitement and, and exhilaration. But it's true in every area, in ritual, in liturgy, in leadership, in impact on the community. And the truth is that there, I believe there's going to be ordination for Orthodox women that is just around the corner. And um, I believe that there's a global solution to uh, the abuses in divorce law uh, just around the corner. And um, I want to be part of the joy when that happens. So that's the, the, the gains are, are part of the... Uh, it's part of the staying power. Um, secondly, recognizing the power of women, which is really awesome. And I don't think women have used their power sufficiently. But every once in a while, I step back and look at it and, uh, and realize how much power women and Women United have. And I, I was thinking, as I was sitting there yesterday, thinking that this wonderful conference basically is just came out of the idea of Ann Browdy's mind. That's how we all got here today. Um, of course, there were many others who helped along the way, but just the power of an idea in a woman's head and then going forward with it is just, this truly never ceases to amaze me. Um, I think creating networks and the support of networks and leaning into the support of networks um, and and uh, staying close to the networks, the support system. For me, those networks have been my family um, and my husband, who is never afraid of criticism and has always been. It's been Jewish feminists in the Orthodox community who have grown in numbers. It's been feminists in other denominations. And I want to say it's also been feminists of other faiths, faiths many of whom are friends of many years in this room. Um, and I had a choice, actually, in preparing this, preparing my remarks, whether to name all the names of people who have been influential in my life or, or give a talk, because they would have taken the same amount of time. <laughs> so I hope that all of my friends here will understand and know that I truly love them and have learned so much from them. Um, another step is to choose that has helped me from being burned out and this is just a practical uh, step, is to choose the arenas uh, for 
argument or debate or dispute and not enter into every fray. Um, I came upon this decision some 25 years ago on a very cold uh, February afternoon after synagogue services, services when I began to feel my toes starting to get frostbitten a half hour after standing on the sidewalk for a half hour in an argument with an earnest young man. And I suddenly had this vision that I could be, spend the next 50 years of my life doing it. Actually, I had the, this vision that in 30 years, someone was going to come around to the synagogue corner and see a petrified blue standing there. <laughs> um, so uh, I've chosen, uh, I don't have a classroom, so I've chosen writing and public lecture and debate as my venue. Uh, and I know that I've lost some wonderful one-on-one -on -one discussions and ideas and insights, but I also know that I could have easily been chewed up uh, long ago if I hadn't protected myself. Uh, another step has been to depersonalize criticism. Early on, I had a hard time with criticism. I was hurt by it. It wasn't crippling, but it was quite intimidating because I'm like most people, want to be loved by everyone. I don't want to be a misfit, uh, but uh, nevertheless, I was a misfit, and so misfits do get a certain amount of criticism. But I learned that um, to... Excuse me. <clears throat> I learned to accept criticism as a form of editing. Uh, as a writer, I love a good editor but I also know I can take it or leave it. And that's what I've learned to do with criticism. Sometimes it's very significantly integrated into my work, and sometimes I just uh, set it aside. And um, in my magnanimous mood, I will say that the critic is coming from the same place that I am, which is to protect the tradition and to maintain its continuity. And I'm not always, I'm not often in that magnanimous mood, but eventually, every once in a while, it, um, it comes out. Uh, so I see it not as misogyny, but as faithfulness and faithfulness to the tradition and fear of its erosion. And uh, I, I can totally identify with that. Um, Another is to keep the humor. I don't have to say anything about that here because um, we've seen, it's been amazing to me, how all of the veterans, every single person who has spoken, has managed to um, be serious about her work but not take herself too seriously and have a delicious sense of humor about this whole journey. Another step has been something that I learned from Jean Audrey a long time ago, and that is the idea of a sabbatical. Because when you get sort of burned out and, uh, and exhausted, uh, the temptation is just to walk away from this thing. And Jean Audrey, many years ago, simply declared herself, she was at that point, and simply declared a sabbatical for herself, uh, which I thought was a brilliant thing, and I followed suit shortly thereafter. And just the knowledge that I don't have to leave when I'm tired um, but, or spent or not contributing anything, but rather can just temporarily step back and then step in again is, is a wonderful, soothing uh, feeling. Another step is to accept the fact that not everything has to be taken to its logical conclusion and that it's okay not to have all the answers. And I used to think it was a pressure to say, you know, what's the next step? I've been able to understand the value of making trade-offs and not feel apologetic for them. This is a process that we're in, and it's not a battle. And some things will happen overnight, and others are going to take much longer for a community that is vested in so much tradition and ritual. So trade-offs are part of the ongoing process, and it's the price, and not a terribly heavy price to pay for me, for staying within the community and continuing to be nurtured by it, by my own faith community and by the sacred texts and teachings of my own community. And I happen to feel very lucky that I am an Orthodox Jew and live an Orthodox way of life. And even though I'm a gadfly within the community, the fact that I can pass this on to my children uh, has been very, very important to me. 
A tenth, I'm up to number ten, I haven't been counting, but it's to reconfigure my own role in this. I'm out of time, okay. Um, and here I want to thank Letty Russell. I, should, I could thank everyone for all of these steps, but Letty Russell wrote something 25 years ago about having a sense of pride, that sometimes a sense of pride is the greater, is the greater merit and, is, and is feelings of humility is the greater sin. I loved her words then, but I didn't really understand them until perhaps 10 or 15 years later. And that is that I used to think part of this enterprise was I and other women were asking for a few handouts, a few crumbs, you know, a few dispensations, if I can make that analogy, a few reinterpretations. And suddenly it occurred to me that this was not what we were all about, that what we were about was making contribution to the community. What we were about was squaring our shoulders and saying that without integrating the values of gender equality, our own traditions would be like the train standing still in a station, that it would be more abundant instead of dynamic and out of touch instead of relevant and fossilized instead of full of life. So our contribution was to have pride in that what we are asking for in terms of women or calling for in terms of women's rights and roles was really a, was giving health to the whole tradition and to the whole community. Eleven was to create an organization and to run conferences and to go to conferences. Creating an organization came late to me, uh, 25 years after I was involved in the, my first conference. Um, the organization has been, well, organization I know, as many of you in organizations can know, can also be the greatest source of burnout and frustration. <laughs> Um, but on the other hand, an organization brings new energy and new cohorts, and it creates an address for people who ordinarily wouldn't gather around the issue. And an organization is really like a covenantal structure, and the chain goes on, and the agenda passes on to a new generation, and that's what I've been experiencing these last few years, to see that the work is being taken over by the next generation has been just one of the highlights of my life. So um, all that energy invested in meetings and in details and in, even in, you know, stroking egos, which often has to be done, is really about the continuity of this agenda. And finally, I try to remember what brought me here in the first place, and that is that this is all about a sense of justice. It's not just about religious tradition. It's about justice and ethics. And one does never, doesn't ever want to walk away from that. Um, do I have three more minutes to talk about my disappointments? Okay, and challenges, okay. One is that feminism is still a suspect word. It's not an honored word, neither in orthodoxy um, and I see the parallel amongst professional women who look out of their corner offices and see no relationship to feminism and say, oh, that's for those feminists, you know. And the same thing goes on within the uh, Orthodox community that women who have benefited from educational opportunities and ritual and liturgy and leadership opportunities distance themselves from feminism. It's frustrating. Secondly, the disappointment is that um, personally, I look back at 30 years and think, where did the 30 years go in terms of my writing? The tension between activism and writing is, has been, uh, activism is so seductive and writing is so uh, isolating and requiring such discipline. Um, the third is that I, the same question about the 30 years. Every once in a while, I get this nagging feeling that the things that we're working on are really things that could be resolved just almost by slate of hand or by a creative interpretation of those who hold the chain of authority or the interpretive keys in their hand. And uh, we're arguing about whether women can be ordained or whether women can be, or whether the divorce law can be reformulated or women can read from the Torah in the synagogue 
And we're doing that while Rome is essentially burning. Uh, and the issues of some violence against women or peace, especially for peace in the Middle East, or the environment or AIDS. I mean, and these are the real burning issues. And sometimes I wake up and say to myself, you know, what am I doing in this little, little box? Um, and finally, the issue of anti Zionism, anti Semitism in the women's movement. That has been a source. Letty spoke about this in detail, and I won't go into it. I echo hers. The only place at which we differ is that she said sometimes she makes the choice one way and sometimes the other way. Uh, for me, um, I always make the choice. My priority is my community, my people. I see much more danger to, uh, I see much less danger in, um, you know, whether the rights to abortion will be withdrawn than I do to Israel's viability or to anti-Semitism, the specter of anti-Semitism that is rising in the world and how that will impact on my children and grandchildren. And I kind of identified with the young African-American women who spoke here about the choices uh, that they make. And I think a great deal of that anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism is based on information, and so it's been particularly painful all these years. The challenges are, I think, to understand for the future, to understand homosexuality in the context of the tradition, and the questions are more theological, I think, than otherwise. I also believe that the challenge is to figure out feminism and equality, allowing for role distinction. I, I think that there's place for distinctive but equal roles for men and women, and in my gut, something in my gut tells me that it suits the human psyche. And um, so I think that's a challenge for defining those fine distinctions as we go on. And the third great challenge for me is to how to keep the power of the commanding voice as one goes through this process. Um, I don't possess an authoritarian personality, and I've always uh, found, yet I should say, yet I've always found comfort in the idea of God as the source of authority and the commandments as emanating from the divine. And observing the law has always been a way of God speaking to me and, and I speaking to God. And reinterpreting the law is one of the ways in which we do this to make this seamless. On the other hand, existentially, I somehow feel in my bones that, uh, uh, again, that there's a less, uh, that there's been some weakening of the sense of the commanding voice in my life. And I can live with it, uh, and I have lived with it. But And I believe, as my husband, Irving Greenberg, has said, and it's written after the Holocaust, that we're part of a generation that accepts the covenant as a voluntary covenant. But maybe because of my own upbringing and background, I think total voluntarism, or too much voluntarism, I should say, won't really sustain me as homo religiosus. So it's one of the challenges. As we tinker with the tradition, uh, we build in inspiration, but we also do face this challenge. Nevertheless, and here I'm, I want to say that it's really, I look at my life these last 30 years, it's been thoroughly exhilarating, it's been a great blessing, and there are more ups and downs, and I can't imagine what my life, how boring my life would have been uh, without all the energy and the drama and the incredible gains and the new strengths and the challenges for women. So I can wake up every morning and bending the sacred lit liturgy a little bit, I can say as part of my morning blessings, thank God for creating me a woman. Thank you.